All right. Well, good good day to anyone who is watching. So if it's night, good night. Well, don't go to bed yet. Good afternoon or good morning. But uh, have with us today, Miguel and I uh, are trying to do this every week, every other week, where we take take some time, half hour or so. This one may go a little longer and talk about faith and, and life and stuff and, and whatever's going on. Uh, this would be, I think, our fourth or fifth episode of doing this. And, and uh, we asked uh, Gene Boyd's on our board here at Evangel to join us. And Marcus Rose is on our staff at, at the church as our adult discipleship pastor and ministries pastor. And we, we thought today we'd have a, just a cross-cultural conversation in, in, in light of all that's happening, the, the race conversations, the protests, the, the killing of, of George Floyd. And that has uh, affected us all in, in different ways. And uh, so I've got, I've got three or four questions I'm just going to throw out to the group. And if you're watching, we hope that this helps you um, maybe process a little bit, maybe understand a little bit more. Uh, even at the end, we're going to ask a, a radical question. I'm going to ask these guys, what do you say to your white friends right now? And then Miguel and I, what do we have to say to our black friends right now? And, and uh, so that'll be an interesting one that we'll close with. And then our last thing will be a scripture that we're leaning on. But I'm going to start just by throwing this out. There's been a lot of moments in life. You look back at, uh, at these different things of life that seem to capture a country. And uh, maybe you guys have had this question or thought about it, but what is it about this moment, um, seeing the police officer kneeling on George Floyd's neck and his death, that has been a catalyst for the last couple of weeks? And in your opinion, that that where other moments haven't reached, you know, it, did, it hasn't resonated like this. What, what's your thoughts and opinion on that? And uh, we'll just, any, any of you start, let's maybe start with Marcus and then we'll um, go from there. Yeah, I think um, there's a couple of things. It was not just one or two things, but I guess a couple means t uh, two, but it, it was a few things that happened. Um, I think one was the fact that it wasn't a police shooting, like we hear about the shooting, but it was like actual, like man, like taking the life of a man and his whole just continence was just on his face was like eh, another day at the office type of deal. Um, and I think that was one of the things and it was a long video. Like, I don't even know how long it was because I never watched the whole thing, but it felt like it was forever. Like, and just to see the other officers that was just there, not doing anything. Uh, kind of fed into if you believe that the police system is corrupt, then you kind of like, see, here's my evidence. And it could be, a, you know, right there. I mean, I, and I feel like people, that's what they're grabbing onto. But also for me, it was the fact that <laughs> just a couple of weeks before we had the issue with uh, Christopher um, Cooper, where the lady was in the uh, park saying, like, I'm going to call the police and I'm going to tell them that you're a black male. male. That was the base... George Floyd was the worst possible outcome of what that call would have been, or she wanted that call to be. That was like a day or two before, wasn't it? Or maybe the week. Oh, I, it's, you know, it's the, the days of it, you know, it's COVID true. is making all the days just kind of mesh together. And then also this is happening, just making all the days mesh together. So the time table might be wrong, but it just seemed like that was that. And so it was just one of those things where, you know, we heard about the Ahmaud Arbery, we heard about Breonna Taylor, we heard about several others that weren't even mentioned. And it was just one of those things where it's just like enough's enough. And I think also our our country matured a little bit in a sense where some of the younger people are starting to step ahead and be leaders, while some of the older people in our country are starting to fade back a little bit and not have as much of or as loud of a voice. And so it wasn't. It was a lot of people that kind of got a chance to speak up and say something. And it just kind of was one of those things where it was like a it's a popcorn effect, like. One person says something, another person says something, and then it was like, oh, so it's not taboo to speak against the police doing something. And so it's okay to speak. And so one person's boldness led to other people's boldness to speak out as well, I guess. That's interesting. I think that having the video is huge because then it's, it's one narrative versus another. But when you sit in, and, and at the funeral, I think they had eight minutes and 48 seconds of silence. Yeah. When you have that amount of time and you're just thinking, um, that's, that, that's, that's so much. I, I mean, you can't, there, you can't 
there's nothing you can say other than that is an atrocity. And Absolutely. yeah, that's in, very insightful, interesting, Marcus. M Miguel, anything on, uh, you want to add then, Gene? No, I mean, the only thing I would say is, as Marcus mentioned, they just keep on piling up. And certainly, like you said, Marcus, being able to see somebody take the breath out of another person is just shocking to witness. Um, and then there's just the fact that it's just over and over and over again. Uh, I think the cumulative effect, it does something. Yeah, and then you had such uniformity. I, every police officer I've talked to, every individual I've talked to, I mean, that, it is a, it is the same thing that, that, that early on, I mean, voices have gotten cloudy recently maybe, but that was, that was un, unfathomable to think that. Gene? Yeah, I would say I think, I mean, of course, you know, we're dealing with COVID right now. Um, so just everybody being isolated, being at home, um, and everybody being open and just tired from that. Um, and then it just, I know, kind of a shocking thought that, you know, when the, we just, we're coming off of the uh, Mar Albury situation, and then I remember telling my wife, is like, and this is unfortunately, like, it always seems like this thing comes in threes. I don't know why. And then that hits so hard. And we're talking about the jogging aspect. And then, you know, Brianna Taylor's story started to kind of start seeping in a little more. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the dog watching situation and that. And then I remember my wife was like, it happened. I'm like, what do you mean? She was like, another one happened. And I was like, another what? And then she, you know, she was like, it's on the internet, you know, in a video. And I hadn't watched the first, I just, the videos are just a lot um, to take in. And so we're starting to see videos of these things. And it just was a lot to digest. It was just a, and to see that it wasn't, like Marcus was kind of saying, it wasn't a shooting. It was taking breath away at, from somebody and they're, they're on their stomach and they're handcuffed. And it's like, okay, handcuffs are supposed to be kind of the end all for police officers when you see we've seen so many people get put in handcuffs and that's kind of like all right we got them in handcuffs you know we got you know we've seen some of the worst killers in mankind from you know, Charles Manson and these people you've seen all these serial killers get put in handcuffs and they go to jail and you're like okay you got you got them in handcuffs like just book them and take them in if that's the case um and to do that and then put your knee on his neck it just was it's just a lot um, and so I think he just, it just was kind of the perfect storm, for lack of a better word, um, with COVID, the media, I mean, we can access this stuff instantly. I mean, it happened, I think on Memorial Day and it's up instantly and we're all waking up in the morning to this stuff and, um, we have, it had our undivided attention and it should. Um, but, um, yeah, I think that's kind of the open wound of it all where it was just like, oh my gosh, we were just starting to unpack these things and then we just dump more more and more pain and more and more salt in the wound is already wide open so for some people it seems like uh this shine the light and, and it's an individual moment but but i you guys would say i i may i don't want to put words in your mouth but this shined the light on more of a timeline of moments that keep happening it's not it wasn't in isolation and mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the conversation that maybe some in white America are understanding maybe for the first time that this wasn't just an incident. It, it was, it's been a number of things. I mean, I'm not saying that there's not great police officers, there's not great departments, but this is a systematic thing that, that, that feels personal because of things that so many not just a couple, but so many, especially black men have gone through and then black moms have, have been, you know, had to deal with it. Am I, am I misstating? Am I understating? What, just what are you guys' thoughts on, on that? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it is one of those things where it is one of those, you kind of, you arrive at this moment in like, for some of us is like trying to balance off the, well, glad, took you long enough to get here, but glad you're here. Um, because a lot of us have been, that's how we kind of feel, but at the same time, you can't be like that because 
not everybody has the same experience or walk the same walk and have the same, you know, genetic, genetic makeup where everything touches them or makes them feel a certain way. But when you see that right there, it just kind of is one of those things you see it in the moment, but then you reflect on all the things in the past where it is like, oh my goodness, so this is what we're talking about. And maybe it was a, you know, something that you seen that was, didn't end up fatally, but you see the end game of what this would, could be. And so you understand like, while you know, trying to take care of it before it becomes fatal, is so important. And so I think that is one of those things where, um, especially our white brothers and sisters are kind of saying, oh, now I get it. Um, now I get it. And I think for myself, like that, this always been the reality or for as long as I can remember, it's always been a reality. Um, that this could happen. Um, and I've shared this before and I'll share it really quickly. Like that was the reality my mother would face whenever you know I got pulled over when I was younger. And I said, I got pulled over by the police for no reason. And that was her worst fear. That was her biggest fear. And I think maybe now there are some people that didn't have to grow up like that or didn't have to experience that, that now they're understanding, okay, I get it now. Dean or Miguel, anything to add? Yeah, I would just kind of piggyback off that as well. I mean, just my mom, she, you know, she just sent out a text message and was just like, when will they see my baby is just the same as everybody else's. Um, and just that cry from your mother getting that text is just gut wrenching. You know, um, I remember being on the phone with her one time. I was like, okay, mom, I got to call you. Right back. I just got pulled over. And she like went into this deep prayer and I was like, Mom, I'm, I can handle it, Mom. I got it. You know, she was like, she just, I mean, she was just crying on the phone. And, I mean, the interaction went well. Um, it wasn't. But just the fear. And, of course, I forgot to call her back. This is in my 20s. And <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't call her back. Um, and when I called her back, you know, she was just pretty much holding her breath the whole time. And it's just the reality of, you know, man, for that fear to be there. Um it's just, it's just, a, it's just an issue, and you know, some, of course, fear has lies in it. I mean, there's, there's two sides to it for sure. Um, but just the way we've been raised and the way we've had to put our guard up um, for these interactions is, um, it's just a lot. It's a lot, and it's very real, very real. So, you know, we we've talked privately and in other groups. Just, you know, I don't think the Lord causes these moments evil causes these moments and and in the lord's uh sovereignty and in will at times he can create a something good out of something evil or sometimes more evil rises up within us you know th those are all personal choices even down to individuals and then as a culture we make but what do you guys see as the opportunity that's before us and then have you seen progress leading even up to this that that gives you hope for where we're headed, or is this just another moment that is going to be on the long line of other ones, or do you feel like we're we're making making progress in, in your lifetime, or even recently in the last couple of years? Um, yeah, um, I think um, I think there has been progress. Um, you know, I think uh, because we live in a microwave society and we want things to happen right now. Um, <laughs> You know, I can fly to London in three three hours on on whatever the jet's called, the Concorde. Mm -hmm. So it's like, why can't this just happen right now? You know, and I think um, I think y'all heard you say something where it's like, yeah, this has been hundreds of years building up, and you go all the way back. This is like one of the, <laughs> I mean, this has been happening honestly. You know, prejudice and hate like this has been happening since the inception of time. So I mean, it's just one of those things where you're not going to turn it around instantly. But I do think that progress has been made. And one of the things I, I was talking to uh, someone today, just saying like, I know I can't get you to get quote unquote here now, but if you can take one step closer, that's progress. And I think sometimes uh, we have to redefine the win. Something we talked about in that book that we've been reading as a staff, um, just talking about how we can redefine the win. And I think that's where we as a society, especially for us who just want change to happen right now, we have to re redefine the win and take the wins that we have, but then also build on those wins and not just first feel like we're won and we're done. And like, oh, just go home, we won. But also if we haven't, we feel like we haven't gotten where we want to be, keep putting 
not necessarily pressure, but keep holding people accountable so we can keep progressing, even if that's holding ourselves accountable um, for our actions, especially. Um, so yeah, I think there has been progress. And I think sometimes it is hard in a moment when your emotions are high, when you feel like we are not moving and you feel like it's still back in the 60s or Jim Crow or Reconstruction and it's not there and yet it's still not where we would hope it to be. So it's just one of those things you have to have a sober mind to be able to kind of deal with that and just judge it for what it really is and then move forward. So yeah, long, long way of answering, yes, some progress. Okay, Miguel, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, it, not having to deal with the pressure, um, you know, I, I don't know if I'm the best person to talk on it, but, but I guess I would just say from my viewpoint, uh, I see a lot of change. Um, I noticed yesterday NASCAR banned the Confederate flag. I know the NFL has been saying that now they're going to uh, promote uh, peaceful protests. I think these are things that would have been unthinkable five years ago. And I think they are some indication of a shift in conscience. I'll come back to that in a second. That one. Uh, Gene, to respond to this. Yeah, I would say the same thing. I, I definitely see progress. Um, just conversations. Um, this conversation we're having right now um, is helping move the needle. Um, and just seeing people um, reach out or address or just try to understand to some degree what it, what it may feel like or just starting to do research just kind of on the history this country has. Um, I think even now we have a lot more opportunity because of, you know, Blacks and all different, everybody's kind of in better situations as far as economically and financially wise. So we're in the workplaces, we're in corporate America. Um, and so there's a, they're able to have a voice and platform to speak into areas where a lot of times it, there was no people of color, that, color there, or they didn't have a status or be able to, or a microphone in front of them. So there's a lot more speaking platforms, even social media can be bad sometimes. But it also is a level playing field where a lot of us can communicate who normally wouldn't talk about these things. So I think um, just the change is happening because of we're able to we're able to talk about it um, in so many different ways. Um, the main thing is just people's hearts are they open for the change? It's kind of the the obstacle, and you know when you're dealing with man, the heart is the is the biggest issue. Yeah. So. Yeah. Social media is wonderful and horrible at the same time because. <laughs> I saw someone post the other day, just because you thought it doesn't mean you need to post it. Uh, that was a good, a good analogy. And then now you're, but it's just, you're seeing like, you can kind of sense wide movements, but then you also get the one person who didn't sleep the night before who half woke up and then posted something and he might not even, or she might not even agree with it. They get two likes out of their 3000 friends. And then we walk around with the pain of what was said, you know, and, and, and sometimes mm -hmm. that, that, right. that, that's, that's, uh, you kind of feel like you're getting sniped, sniper shot from the corner. Where'd that come from? All of a sudden you're just swiping through, you know, someone fell on the ice and then the next one, you're just kind of, whoa. And so that's, that's a, a weird spot to be. And now I don't know. Oh, I remember what I was going to ask. So, um, so like the Robert E. Lee, we, this was not, we don't know this question's coming. It's just coming right now. It's coming in hot. Because Robert E. Lee's, I was like, wait a minute, what? All right, Robert E. Lee statue, for example. We're, we're burning stuff like that down. Miguel mentioned the flag, and we're burning down, I think there was something brought down where a slave auction block or something. How, just in your opinion, do you feel like, are we erasing history? Or are we renaming, like in the biblical times, like there's a lot of things about renaming something that changes changes the spiritual nature of it or a person a land a city so there's some things that are, are great about you know renaming a block that maybe has had a bunch of issues in the past but then that's at, is there another point where if you take down a monument to something are we then going to forget what happened or when we pause it that to remember oh man that was yeah the civil war was fought right here and that guy did that and this is what he stood for just that's really hot. I was just hearing a lot of people talking about that today. So I just thought I'd throw it in since, since Miguel mentioned that. I just watched a, 
there's no, and then this is, there's no, here's the other thing. There's no, I wanted to say, there's no wrong answer here. Cause I think there's a lot of nuance to it. And I think sometimes we all, we all quickly, whoever we're, whether Republican, Democrat, black, white, we're like, this is the answer. And even in our own communities, we don't have, so I'm not saying that if you're right or wrong, if you're watching, don't write us an email, you can, but. Send them all to Jason. I don't know. Yeah. Forward <laughs> <laughs> them on to me, guys. That's it. Yeah. Just what, what's your thought on that? Out of curiosity. I, I would say this, and it's two parts of this. Uh, part of me is cynical in saying that some of this stuff is coming down because it's beneficial and or profitable for people. Um, I think that some of these, especially NFL, they're saying stuff because I don't know necessarily if it is a change of heart, but your employee base is predominantly black and you right. appeal to a, you know, urban, you know, urban audience, even though it's a mix, but a lot of your audience is a you know, black audience. I mean, so it's one of those things where it may be beneficial and profitable. That's so hard. I don't know. It's a business a move than a heart move. I think it is. And even as you see, like, um, and we've had discussions about things that have happened in our city where I was like, uh, it isn't what it is, but it seems to be on the surface. There's even the fact like, hey, even when Roger Goodell can say we're sorry, we're well, sorry for what? You know, it's one of those things that then you say we, you don't even mention the principal person antagonist, quote unquote, that he has in this argument, which is Colin Kaepernick. You can't even mention his name. And so it's just one of those things where the cynical side of me says it's a, it's a chess move, not a true repentant heart. Uh, but at the same time, for these monuments and things that are coming down, I think I've heard a, a sports commentator at that, which is a great funny that he speaks on this. But Bomani Jones talks about how a lot of these things don't need to be monuments. They need to be in museums so we can go and revisit and see those things. But just some of the monuments that we have and some of the places we have are just like kind of crazy. Like the monument, the Confederate monument that's in like Montana. Like first off, Montana wasn't even part of the union back then, let alone part of the South. Like, so what are we doing? And I, so what was the purpose of those monuments? And it was, I mean, I think that's what the other thing. And so I get where some people hold fast to those and say, you're tearing away our heritage, you're tearing away our history, but there's a place for those. They're called, and they're called museums. And put them in museums where if people want to visit it, they will go and visit it. And that's just my opinion. Um, and when it comes to renaming stuff, and I think even with, in a biblical sense, there were instances where things were uh, re uh, renamed, but there was also times where God said, utterly destroy it or tear it down. And I think we just kind of had to figure out what God is saying to us in this moment. And so, um, okay, yeah. People are asking that question of the Lord. Who yes. are the I doubt, well, yeah. <laughs> Anyone else on that? We don't have to stay on it a while. That was a bonus uh, trap question probably. for. <laughs> <laughs> but Gene, anything to add? Um, I'm kind of in the same boat. Um, yeah, that stuff we, we can definitely put in uh, museums. Um, really tell it in, you know, history books. Um, Wikipedia, you can look it up, um, but just, <laughs> um, it's, it, there's just a lot to it. I'm never going to go see it. Um, I don't know what I'll do if I did see it, so I don't need to be near it. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that's, I think it's definitely something that can be placed in museums. It is a history. Um, and just with the history, like we, that word is such a, we can go we can go a lot of places with that as well like so it's we're going to really unpack it and we're going to start moving past it and move to you know move towards something better um then we gotta really you know even the word history to me you know it's like free up okay you know we have black history um we have american history and it seems like black history carries some of the american history things and we're carrying the weight of those things the racism the slavery um I would love to be freed from those police brutality. Let's free up that from black history and let's put that in American history. Um, let the black history kind of speak out to the Martin Luther King, some of the success stories um, to kind of help ease so we can grieve because I think it's been all kind of lumped in and we throw it into, uh, we throw it all in a barrel and we end up carrying it. Um, so I know it kind of got off a little bit, but just in yeah. the history, stuff it's just kind of uh it's it's a nasty it's a nasty nasty past um we definitely need to move forward all right gene we'll keep with you on this one what uh you know we, we've been talking a lot 
in in the church and in I have just about bridging gaps and building bridges and and uh what what small steps are are you seeing people take personally or or yourself to just try to be uh go cross cultural like we've talked about here at a church and where where are you seeing that is it harder than you thought it'd be is it are the, is the door wide open right now uh just maybe any baby steps small steps or even large steps that you're you found as as you're having conversations or are you having to you know, knock down the door to have conversations or is it pretty easy right now? And then even the burden of that, maybe. But we'll get to that in a second. I have one other question kind of about that. But <clears throat> go ahead and then I'll come to Miguel and then we'll end on this one with Marcus. Yeah, I would say, um, of course, initially, I didn't I didn't feel like anything. I didn't feel like saying anybody. I want to talk to anybody. Um, I was just numb. I mean, I guess I can't say I was numb because I was just completely emotional. Um, couldn't yeah, even I, talk. I in the board meeting. No, it was, yeah, it was no works. I had nothing. I had it was complete shock. Um, so I think, um, you know, seeing that since then, it's amazing that I'm on here talking now, but um, there's a responsibility um, that I feel um, in being a lot of times, um, in a lot of places, um, I'm the only black guy in the room. Um, you know, I worked at a country club for 20 years, um, built up relationships. Um, and so a lot of People from the country club have been reaching out. Um, I've actually got a meeting tonight at nine o'clock with one of uh, one of the one of the guys from the country club. He's got some pastors and they want to talk. And one of the pastors was like, "It's like four pastors," and he was like, "I don't want to meet up and it'd be a bunch of white guys talking about this. If you don't have we don't have anybody of color, um, then what what are we talking about?" So he reached out to me, and so I'll be having this conversation tonight. But um, just seeing the change, people wanting to understand people wanting the healing and people wanting to move forward. Um, it's, it's, it's great to see that happening. Um, so me, I can't, I'm one of the ones who's I say one of the ones, and there's definitely not a very humbly speaking, but just a person who has a voice, um, who, who's built relationships with um, black, white, and all across the line. And some of these people are difference makers. They're employers, they're the pastors, they're CEOs. So, um, and a lot of times I'm the only guy they know, um, or if they don't know, has a relationship with in order to kind of ask the, the, the dumb question per se. Um, so I feel like it's a responsibility, um, for me to go out and talk, um, just got to pray up before it and mm -hmm. host, host some conversations that can spark some change. So I so definitely, a lot of things happen for sure. You're saying yes to everything right now is kind of what yeah. I'm hearing. If, yeah. Yeah. If there's an opportunity, it's there. Miguel? Yeah, as far as are people talking about this, I, I think so. I think sometimes it is hard as a white person to know. I, I, I kind of feel like maybe this isn't the time to talk. I feel like maybe it's a better time to listen. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess in that sense, as far as knowing our role in communicating right now is difficult. We talked briefly about it in last week's episode, but generally you just want to get out there and kind of take charge and say what you know and you feel confident about what you know. But right now, I, I don't feel that way or always know what to say. So without going into details, Miguel, maybe just share a little bit about how maybe you had told me you kind of stepped out and then we're like, did I do that right? And sure. Yeah, for sure. I know you called yeah, that. Yeah, it's trying to have conversations, trying to – um learn and reflect but i'll be honest here there there is especially on social media kind of a a culture of of cancel and if somebody says something that doesn't completely agree with you there's a tendency to just kind of cancel them and that, that happens from both sides and so if you step out and talk and share authentically you're not going to please everyone um, and, and sometimes people are not just judging your opinion as wrong, but they're choosing to see you as an enemy because you spoke, which is not a danger you have if you don't speak. And I'll even speak to that because I think that's one of the errors that for us who feel like it's, we have the voice to speak to this or we know the solution, quote unquote, um, when someone else speaks up and they say something, you know, whatever wrong. 
um, you can't cancel them out because then and then in the next breath say, well, you need to say something because you just told me I shouldn't say anything because I said the wrong thing. I think uh, one of the things we've talked about in the mo many meetings we've been in, Pastor Jason and the groups we've been in is like, you know, we just got to allow grace, man. And I think um, sometimes um, I'm, I'm a person that works better when I, I have room to make a mistake. Like if I can't, if I have to be perfect, I don't, I don't function well with that um, because I know that <laughs> I am flawed. I am emotional. I am sometimes too in, in my head. So I overthink or I'm over emotional. So a lot of times my response or my action will be wrong. And so if I had known that I can't have that room to be wrong, then man, I'm, I know I'm not going to operate well. And I think that's for us, me, especially me, just like if someone says something wrong, not to just bash them over the head. And then again, on the next voice, they speak up because they're like, well, no, I don't want to speak because last time I said something, I got crucified. So I learned. I it's incumbent on upon us is be to say, if someone says something wrong, like I pull them to the side or send them a text. Hey, let's talk. He said, what were you thinking with this? And I think I've had a few of those conversations where someone's asking me, what was I thinking? And then also I've had plenty of them this week where the conversation was just, hey, tell me what you were thinking. And I think that's one of the things where, it, to speak to even your question, Miguel, you, your, your story matters to us too, because we need to understand your experience so we know maybe why you don't sound like us, maybe why you don't have the same perspective of us. And I think that helps out a lot. And so still share your story, even if you feel your story, your story isn't mm -hmm. part of this story. Your story is a part of this story because it helps us to understand, okay, I know why Miguel thought this and he had a great heart for this, yet maybe it came out this way. And so that's where, where we, do, we can have it. So I say, yeah, still talk to you and share your story. That proximity, man, changes a lot of our hearts yeah. and how we feel about one another. And knowing that you have the freedom to ask the question is so helpful. And even the law of timing with uh, John Maxwell, you know, the, the right thing at the wrong time is, is the wrong thing. And learning, learning in these moments, hey, I can still feel something, but it's, this isn't the time to say it. You know, there's a time to laugh and a time to grieve and a time to mourn and a time to correct. And, and just kind of walking those paths together are important. I, I found uh, what's been interesting is actually being online like this has maybe created some more opportunities for conversation uh, and unless we would have done them inside of classes but uh, a couple times in groups we'll just say hey before you go let me just see how things are going or Marcus you created time in our class the other night and uh, those have been some surprisingly can't I'm surprised how vulnerable and open people are right away across the screen <laughs> which tells you one, the ease of which they can share, but maybe also I've been waiting for someone to ask and maybe that's not happening. I don't, I don't know for sure, but, but just asking how, how it's going or how are you doing is, uh, and then creating space to listen is, is probably been the baby step I've, I've tried to take if possible. Mm -hmm. And then, then in big moments, uh, like on Sunday, a couple of weeks ago, just trying to say what, what Marcus was just saying, Hey, if our heart's in the right direction and we get offended, then let's, let's choose the heart because we're trying to move in the right direction. And, and then in, in a church like ours, this will be a segue. <clears throat> That's diverse of age and a lot of, a lot of people growing up in, in way different environments and what, what students are growing up today in, uh, let alone diversity of, of culture and church background and, and then diversity of race in our church. Um, I've been super, you know, 99% proud of our church, even though we haven't been able to see everybody and what I feel is happening. But my, my question is, is it harder or easier being in a diverse church right now or both? And uh, I know in Archie, it's, it's a little different. It's not quite as diverse, but you guys are probably the most diverse church in town uh, from age range to even, even the other side of stuff. So good job there. But how, how do you feel, and then Miguel, you know, you're up here quite a bit as well, but just how, how has this been? There's, I, I would guess there's more opportunity for help and more opportunity for hurt, but just respond. What's your thought right now? Or has been your thoughts? Or do you want me to start? Because I could talk for a bit. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's see what you got to say. 
I feel Oh man. Okay, maybe I don't have a lot to say. <laughs> it's uh it's a nuance. It's so it's a very interesting because up until this point, to be just as candid as I can be, it's really been easy is not the wrong word. It's just been you know what's right and you know what to say, you know what scripture says, and so you just say it. And that's kind of been, hey, oh, well, let's look at the woman at the well. There's a lot of prejudice going. Let's talk about that. So um, probably the first time I felt interestingly tense was when Marcus said, let's do this on purpose. Let's have some cross-cultural conversations last year. And then we're like, okay, who's showing up on this? And how are we going to be? And, and so that was, and then I was like, okay, that was a good litmus test to see where our con congregation was, but also was, I spent more time thinking, praying, and preparing for that than even Sunday morning services, just because I knew it was so important. This moment here, um, I don't even know if I have words to quite describe the feelings, because we're not together. And I'm not saying spiritually, I'm saying we're not physically together. There's something that's lost across the screen when you can't see body language. You can really almost shouldn't write about it it feels like anything i've written i'm rereading a hundred times and just because and then and then everyone's already on edge with the pandemic and everyone's already feeling like going you know and not that we don't love each other but it's rare to have a moment where we aren't 90 percent like yeah let's go win people for jesus let's have kid service well half the people are like no let's not have kid service which but they're being great. But right now we're already like, kind of like, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Or I don't know if I like that. And then to throw this right now, there's been some moments of extreme vulnerability of, I hope we all come back when this is over. Cause I don't know what everyone's feeling. Now those are in my weak moments and in the difficult moments. And then what I'm seeing is not that I'm, I'm super grateful that for what we have and the opportunity for us to have conversations like that like i know you guys have been conversations you're saying i'm like super proud that you guys would choose to be part of our church and and then have those conversations and in some small way be a representative of of evangel while you're doing that and hopefully we have some good things coming there so there's a big mix there but it also feels like um is someone going to hit that pebble and the you know, the, the hill's going to wash away and, and what's going to happen. But because um, these are testing moments. What, are we really with each other? Are we not? Are we really going to have these conversations? Are we really going to be for one another? And, uh, and, I, and, I, I'm, and I, sometimes I don't know that you know until you're in the middle of it. And I feel really excited about how the church has responded and even in, in moments where People are like, why are you doing that? They're saying, uh, we, we know you love us and both sides, whatever side you're on, whatever race you are, we know your heart. And, and that's, I don't know, that's, I guess, how I'm feeling. It's, it's great, and it feels a lot different. And I'm really happy to have people that I can just say, would you guys join me in a conversation? Like, yeah, let's do it. Versus, I don't know anybody who I would even have a conversation with this about. So this is super healthy. But man, it's felt real vulnerable in this season. So hopefully that makes sense. I'll stop. Yeah. <clears throat> one other thing, sorry, one other thing is, <laughs> is I feel, and you guys have kind of corrected me on this a little bit. Like we're, we're about ready, we're in Romans 12, activate. And then I read the end of Romans 12 and Romans 13, I'm like, I'm not going to preach that. <laughs> and then, especially, it read differently than it did two weeks ago. And then I feel like the Lord's saying, no, you're, you're the spiritual leader. You, I already gave this to you to speak in this moment. And even though you think some things have changed, uh, you're still a voice that needs to do this. And I'm like, well, who am I to lead Marcus's family, Gene's family, you know, list the hundreds of others in this moment? from my 47 year old northern minnesota very tanned complexion that I have <laughs> to lead us through that and and 
and you guys have been super helpful to say, you know, it's, it's the gospel and what the gospel's saying and, and we're here to support and, and you and walk through that. So I feel under qualified to be a voice and yet encouraged that you guys are saying, let's, we got to go for it. And you're my leader and pal. Anyway, so it's a very, uh, it's just weird. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay you guys each a hundred bucks for listening to me because <laughs> getting a good counsel here. As leave, well. so. leave it in my mailbox. Um. <laughs> Actually, I better not have said that. Let's erase that part. I'll take it off or something. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think um, I think that your your feelings are kind of across the board. I can say for at least for myself, it doesn't mix emotions, and I think it is when it is you have those wins where you're like, this is this is what this is why I signed up to do ministry, and then you see those posts or you get those questions or you get those texts or you get that person, and you're like, oh, that's the same person that sits right over in there, and they and you're like, oh, they go to our church and they think like that, I'm like, oh my goodness. I think that's the one thing where it's just like, it's kind of hard, but it's also the beauty of how God works. Like the fact that he can put a Republican and Democrat, black and white, old, young, um, someone who is a, you know, probably a black nationalist in the heart or someone maybe a white nationalist at heart in the same congregation, listen to the same message and maybe not moved in the same direction, but they're moved. Um, and I, I pray that the spirit can challenge us. I think that's the beauty of being in a diverse church and it's a challenge. And I'm pretty sure for you, it's like, oh, well, I don't feel that like privilege all the time. I feel like I'm just like pulling my hair out. But at the same time, I think it is where those emotions are there for a reason. And I think uh, I said this to you um, in a text message or something. I forgot. It's like, I think we, we, we want to be so intellectual and thought, give, and give so much thought to things, but God gave us feelings for a reason. He didn't tell us that they're, that you know, we should run with them and they should lead us, but they're there for a reason. So they kind of give us to let, let us know when something's going on and maybe we can uh, look into it a little more, but that doesn't necessarily have to lead us, but we don't also have to forsake those either. And I think David, he wrote a lot of times and you can see his emotion was all over the place. And then he always brought it back to God. And I think that's one of the things for me, mm. it is where it's like, my emotions are all over the place. I don't know how many times I've cried, to God, laugh to God, just said, forget God, I'm not about to do this today. And God's like, all right, well, I'll see you in about 10 minutes when you say you're back ready. And God's like, he's good with it. And I think that's where, for me, I have to be good with it, understand that there is some internal conflict going on. But don't, don't run away from it, dive into it, let God take care of it. And, you know, and so leading in the diverse church is being a, it's been something. I will, and I'm pretty sure at the end of this, I'll say it's a joy. But right now, it's it, it can be. It's something. And again, like you know, on the board we have multiple representation on the on the staff, you and Cass, and you know, and then then other like like Ryan and others. But that's a bit other race. But it's uh, it's lonely, I'm sure, at times as well for you, Marcus. And yeah, you're doing you're doing great. Appreciate sure. you, Jean. Yeah, I, um, I love it. Um, I think it offers, especially crazy, you know, me being nominated to be on the board. Um, that was a complete shocker, surprise. Um, but with that, um, just since being, you know, I guess, quote unquote, behind the curtain and just being in the room and just seeing the way we approach things, everybody has different backgrounds and, but, and upbringings and age and different professions and, you know, there's sometimes where you're like, I don't know how, how, how am I going to have a voice in this situation? But everybody gets a turn. You see what, first, I guess, just the back to you and just the way the, the ministry and the leadership, just a humble, a humble leader, a humble servant after God's will, you know, and really wanting to do that. And when that's delivered properly, it just opens the door. So it's like, I heard, I remember somebody, a friend of mine, he said, you know, when somebody being submissive, it bursts a leader. And it was like, you have been that for us. And so it bursts leaders in all of us. It bursts um, just opportunities. And so with having that diverse church, um, we all get a chance to, um, to be ourselves, first and foremost. I mean, you know, I got a chance to rap on Easter Sunday. You know, it's like, what? Who gets to do that? You know, I would have never in a million years, I was always told you can't rap in church and rap doesn't belong here and you give me the microphone before you even take it on Easter Sunday and it's just um it's just amazing to be a part of um the body and seeing that and so 
with this, you know, with Pastor Marcus bringing the cross-cultural and you guys, you know, bringing that last year, with us being ahead of this where we can talk about this and nobody's surprised. It's like, hey, we've already been doing this now, you know, should we be doing it more or less? Who knows, you know, but um, for us to already have adopted this practice and we're kind of ahead of it, it's nothing new. Um, it's just an extension of Evangel and it's just, it is, it is a good thing. Um, it comes with its challenges, but what are, you know, challenges are, met, are made to be met, yeah. you know, and so we'll overcome them together or, or fail together. <laughs> yeah. 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 If you're living, it's challenging. Doesn't matter yep. what you're doing. Miguel, any thoughts? Yeah, I would just say, you know, if you're not familiar with Archie, um, Archie is a town of about a thousand people, uh, predominantly white, would be an understatement. I can't remember the exact, I know it's high 90s or whatever. And so there's not a lot of racial diversity. And one challenge that I have just for people in a context like this is it feels like racism is just easy sometimes when you're away from kind of cultural tension. And in fact, weirdly, it's kind of easy to become judgmental of those who are struggling with it because when there's not a ton of racial diversity, actually things, you know, there's not a lot of racial disharmony. You know, people do not tend to like pick on, um, you know, the minorities in our community. It's just, I, there's just not a lot of racial, but which is great. And sometimes just like, well, you know, that's not an issue and, and, I don't understand why people are making a big deal of this when, when you're trying to um, bridge a lot of different bridges every day, it is more challenging, you know, and I, I would just, that would just be my thought on this is especially for those who are far from it. I actually weird, it's weird, but it's easy to be judgmental in a weird way. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Interesting. All right. We'll be quick here. We're getting, you guys are too easy to talk to, or I talk too much, either one of those two. <clears throat> Maybe just one, one thought you'd say to someone across the, the racial divide of, or going cross-cultural, uh, but let's have Marcus and Gene say, you know, what would you say to your white friends if you could have a sentence or two or a thought, you know, maybe a paragraph or so in this moment, and then Miguel and I maybe talk to talk to our, our black friends uh, about what, what would something we could say and whether it's for ourselves or maybe giving a voice to maybe some things that, that we've heard others say that, that we'd want our, our black brothers and sisters to know, if that makes sense. Um, and so there you go. You're, I don't know if anyone will watch it, but you have a chance to say something. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I'll, I'll just say what I've been saying to a lot of people, just, be open to listen, um, be open to uh, question everything. Um, I think I've shared this before where my pa old pastor would say, question everything, even me, but just be ready to understand exactly why I do what I do. And I think that's where, you know, a lot of the things where we had to question, even some of our upbringing, it's question, even questioning, it may, you might find out, okay, it was a good thing. And then you might find out, well, maybe they were wrong. And I know that's tough to question even your parents or grandparents or your heritage or whatever. Sometimes you got to question it because sometimes you get the, this miseducation that's just in you and you got to kind of just fight against it. So just be open to listen, start questioning things that is like a norm within you or the way you have been structured to think or to feel and to question it. And then if it's some resistance or if there's a conflict, uh, ask why it is there and you know, work with that. And then have people around you that can help you through this. Gene is in my accountability group. And with a couple of other guys, they hold me accountable. And if I mess up or say something or do something, they call me out. They don't let me slide. And I think be willing to be, be able to be held accountable. Um, and I think sometimes it's, it's hard in the moment to be held accountable. But after a while, you're like, you know what? They're just trying to make me better. And I think that's one of the things that helps out. And so, yeah, just listen, you know, question what's going on. And if something pops up where it's questionable and let someone hold you accountable. Gene? Yeah, I was, you know, you want to think of some big lofty thing and, you know, it just kind of brought me back to just, you know, small gestures, you know, little, little things go a long way. I know for me and my, my wife, you know, it's kind of, it's crazy to think like, 
you know, we're looking for a house or, um, where, you know, you're driving around in neighborhoods and stuff like that. So you're going out to the suburbs, Lee Summit, Raymore, um, Blue Springs, um, Lee Wood, Overland Park, whatever. And you drive in these neighborhoods and just a simple wave does so much to let us know, wow, they might accept us here. Um, so, and it's crazy to think that that means so much, um, but that lets it's like, uh, oh, my son can possibly play here and it's not happening. And so uh, we got a ways to go when just a, a gesture that small um, means that I might take an opportunity that can change my family's life, quote unquote, by getting them in a school district um, that we would want them to get into um, or just op whatever opportunities presents itself within that. Um, and it's, it's so I, I guess the aspect of just realizing that I know a lot of people don't know what to do with this situation. Um, being an ear, like Marcus was saying, listening, um, but just, man, leading with love, letting, you know, praying, letting God purge your heart on this situation right now. Like, okay, where, where do I lie in this? What, what have I not seen? Um, okay. And how can I know, you know, we don't need to be fake. We don't have to be all, you know, all that, but, I think it's just, it's more simple than we think, and it's harder than we could possibly imagine, you know. But um, yeah. just me, I know, how does, what does that even mean? But um, it means I guess, a lot. I think, yeah. yeah, like simple gestures um, go a long, can go a long way um, when somebody's driving a neighborhood, when they're visiting a school, or all those type of things. Um, so just greetings, um, just the basics. Um, are what gonna help kind of start this and help move us in the right direction? I guess if I'm, that's kind of what first came to mind, and yeah, so that was. Yeah. It. I guess I would just say, uh, um, I always start with just I'm sorry for everything you're going through, and uh, forgive me uh, as I search for language and in my awkwardness, and uh, please keep the door open. Yeah. So, yeah, I would, I would say I've had a few conversations with you guys and then others seen some tough on things on TV from guys saying, you know, I'm, man, it's tiring having the same conversation and doing, leading the journey on this. And, and uh, I, I would just say thank you for your patience and endurance and having those conversations and telling your story uh, because for so many, especially, you know, I grew up in a small town. Miguel's situation. I mean, most of our country 40 years ago was rural. And if you weren't from the South, that meant mostly white. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, most, most of my friends I grew up with, unless they moved somewhere, uh, this was a, these conversations might be the first ones they've ever had, or it's your thousandth. And, uh, so thank you for your patience, I would say. And, uh, and being open to, to questions and, and some of them may seem the most naive thing you've ever heard, but uh, it helps. It helps us. I've had a few conversations with some pastors and guys, and, and some things that that you would say that's basic, you know, race conversation one on one. Um, they'd never had in their entire life had anyone say that particular thing, and uh, so it's a journey. We're out at a journey, and I would just say thanks for your patience and and. Uh, keeping it real with us and sharing your story and, and, and vice versa, allowing us to come alongside and be on the journey is, is huge. And it's a privilege. So last thing we're done is what scripture verses are you leaning on right now that, that are, that are providing strength that it's nourishing your soul and maybe just one each and then, then I'll, then I'll close us. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think for me is the Galatians, uh, Six, I think it's nine. Don't grow weary and doing well. Just that's just like all right, God. Well, I, I can't. I'm just gonna lean on you. And when I get tired, I'm gonna retreat like you, Jesus did. And or he, I need time with God. I will. When it's time for me to get back in there, I will. Yeah, Miguel. Isaiah 42, one through four. Uh, Here's my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. 
I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. Good. Gene? Um, for me, you know, it's just back to the, just the Our Father, um, just the parts where, you know, to lead us not into temptation and deliver us for evil, um, just forgiving those trespasses against us and all those, just all the layers of the Our Father um, just really has been what got me to where I am today to be able to talk about this. Um, so just really realizing God, God's got his hands on us um, and there's ways out of this. Um, so, yeah, that's been the one I've held on to. I can memorize, I know it by heart the easiest. Uh, and so it just, uh, just wanted to hold tight on. Good. Uh, mine right now has been just, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation and that we're his, we're his plan. This is it. We're, we're the plan for reconciliation, so we better take that seriously <laughs> and be about it. However scary or exciting that is, um, th that's, that's our job. And uh, that, that can lead us into some amazing moments and some surprising places. So thank you, guys. Uh, I just You guys are uh, some of my favorite people to hang out with and, and uh, talk life with and just goof around with. And, and it's, a, it's a joy to, to walk that path. And and uh, also to walk this path together how whenever we find ourselves uh, let's let's keep doing that and and uh, shine in whatever light we can uh both on the, the problems of our world and uh, on the gospel light so anything else as we close all right thanks guys uh, i will pray and then we'll stop lord i pray uh, for each of my brothers here ask for blessing upon them and Thank you, God, for the voice that you've given them, the life you've given them. Lord, it's not an accident that we were born where we were, when we were. And, Lord, I pray that you would help us uh, in these wild and crazy, and, and, Lord, what your scripture would describe, evil times, that we would also make the most of every opportunity that is before us. And uh, help us to uh, not shy from the hard conversations, but also, Lord, help us to walk in truth and grace and to uh, be agents of change. And Lord, I even pray that if you would make it possible for us to do it in such a way where people willingly and excitingly come to places of change instead of being dragged to it because they see it's the best way. Your way is always the best way. So God, we just give you our lives and may we be used for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Thanks everyone for watching.